Welcome to the CEO of Destiny podcast, where you will find the tools to fulfill the purpose of your generation and wildly succeed in the marketplace. And now your host, Andre J. Benjamin. So that means it's going to be more than a trillion every year after 2020. If you go to usdebtclock.org, it's a great, uh, it's a great place to see how much we currently owe. We used to watch it and it just became morbid. It's like, <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, and so there's another, uh, there's one other aspect to this, which is an unfunded liability. This means we have made promises to people in, yeah. in, in social security and Medicare, yet we don't have a pool of money to back up that promise. It is just something we're going to have to pay as we go. And through but demographic, people believe that it's sitting in the cloud waiting for them. It's waiting. They do have some money. I'm not saying they don't have money in, in the, uh, social security fund or in Medicare, they have some, some but not enough, but not enough. And so they're good, you know, to handle baby boomers. And after that, because of demographics, because of how big the boomer population was and having that many people age versus how many people are going to be working when social security was created, there was one, there were three workers for every retired person. Uh, that isn't going to be the same when boomers are starting like right now. And so uh, there's just, I think they've estimated 100 to 120 billion of unfunded liabilities. And so we just have a, a big, uh, uh, a totally uh, unmanageable amount of money that we're going to owe. And so the, the Federal Reserve has two choices. They can monetize that debt. And what that means is continue to keep interest rates lower than inflation, which basically burns off the purchasing power of, of money. And so they're gonna do that for 10, 15, 20 years and then effectively be able to pay off the debt. So how long do you see, before we start talking about um, in investment classes and a little bit about a little more about blockchain because you alluded early on to how you got exposed to it and even your first interactions with it and I, I what I loved about the book I shared this before we started recording is that I always want to have a very sound conversation with people because of the generational differences because I know that there are people that watch the show and that listen to the podcast that are um, not familiar with some of these concepts I don't want to just act like something is a magic pill or it's a cure all to everything that we're facing. So that's what I enjoyed about your book is that you lay out and you just say, this is what's going on. These are the problems. Here are some of the proposed solutions. What are you going to do here? You know, the information's laid before you. So can you speak a little bit to um, some of the things that people can do in their personal economics, how they are carrying themselves, what, you know, how they would even select investments the important of the importance of evaluating investment classes and why investing, just like you said, is 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 this is getting out of bed. It's actually you know getting into the game, getting into the show, rather than hoping that things are gonna, just going to pan out based upon what you earn from a job or what you earn even from people who have small businesses, but they've really just made it somewhat of a more of a, a it's just another job and they don't take their money and make the money work for them. Can you explain? kind of the importance of that and these principles of investing and why you even, or why you notice the difference. Cause you talked about going to school and you talked about working. So talk about how, you know, you got, you, you, you started investing and buying and the stock worked out well for you. Talk about how you started to see that and, and, and how people can see that difference versus just working a job and not, um, and just putting it in the bank. You know, I hope that makes well, sense. I think what's in it, one thing that's important is to know about long wave economic cycles, really. And so um, those sh short wave economic cycles are driven by credit, but the long wave economic cycles are always uh, driven by technological revolution. It's happened five times in the last 200 years. It happened when, uh, 
we were in the industrial age. It happened with railroads. It happened when we electrified the cities and all the grids. It happened with oil and automobiles. And it happened with the internet and the age of communications. I think we've begun a new long wave economic cycle. And I think we've seen evidence of it over the last decade uh, with artificial intelligence, the internet of things or sensors and robotics, companies have gone about delivering on automation. They're just trying to automate everything. And that's been powerful, but it hasn't been transformational. It hasn't exactly. trained, it hasn't transformed how businesses are gonna function. The last piece of that puzzle really is cryptocurrency because it allows us to store, process, and value um, store, process, and transfer value, you know, economic value without human intervention. And so as these four technologies converge. So peer-to-peer, -peer, when you say that, you're speaking of peer-to-peer -peer versus having a third party, you know, why, why if, if, if all money is quote unquote digital in the first place currently, why do, why does the bank only have certain operating hours and why does it take multiple days and why are you charged fees to go across seas or whatnot? You know, it's only yeah. six, after 6 p.m. You can't do a transit. It doesn't make any sense currently. And with blockchain, we're going to be able to have programmatic money. We're going to be able to, you know, create uh, bots and create these programs that say, you know, if something happens, then send, you know, this Bitcoin or this Ethereum here or there. If uh, something happens, if um, interest rates change, then move money from here to there, all auto autonomously. It, it can make decisions in the field in real time and then, uh, and then move, be able to move money. Uh, that's, that's transformational. If you can converge AI, IOT, robotics, and money and cryptocurrency, those four things together, can, you can create autonomous operation. Now, why is that powerful? Because the world is built on comp competition and autonomy is the ultimate competitive advantage. You know, it, it's the cheap, it's 24 seven, it works for you. You don't have to feed it. You know, it's going to be the most competitive approach to, to business. So we're going to see more and more autonomous agents. And so what I would, well, what I advocate is, cons you know, consider these long wave economic cycles. What are these about? And investing in those. That's where I would be investing. So when you speak on blockchain, define what a blockchain is. What are, what are the blocks? Right. The blockchains solve a, a couple problems, but they're good for like one or two or a few use cases. They really can't be applied to a bunch of problem sets because they're slow and they're expensive and they only do a couple things really well. But what they do allow peer-to-peer -peer transactions because um, Blockchains are immutable. That is, they cannot be, a record that is put into a block cannot be um, changed. What happens is blocks are built upon blocks, are built upon blocks. And so everything in the past can be determined, you know, and seen and can't be changed because of future blocks. Every continued block just makes, uh, guarantees the, the, the viability and the accuracy of past blocks. Um, so that immutability is very important. It also allows a uh, consensus without a third trusted third party. So it allows us to do peer-to-peer -peer transactions. That's never been done. I mean, right now, all economic transactions are ultimately settled by a third party, by a bank that then goes to a commercial bank that then goes to a central bank. So. Uh, there's always a third party to settle a transaction. So to be able to do it peer to peer eliminates friction, friction in the, in the form of time and money and, and expense. And so uh, 
a great application of, of blockchain is to be money and to be able to transact money. Uh, Mark Cuban said that people should put 1% of their net worth towards crypto class. If they don't, they could miss out. What do you think of this statement? He said it like a minimum of 1%. What do you think about that? Yeah, I would say 5%. Yeah, at least 5%. And then for every book you read, you can go up 5%. Makes sense. Because you're um, saying uh, the learning curve. Yeah, you really need to be educated about this. Um, one of the most important factors in investing is conviction, right? You need to be, you need to be right and you need to have the conviction. Um, conviction is so important because when things get rough, what are you going to do? And so. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do us a favor. If this was useful in any way for you, please go to iTunes and leave us a review. Reviews will allow others to easily discover the podcast. If you'd like more information and to receive a free download, rediscover your destiny, go to ceoofdestiny.com. Thanks again and tune in next time.